Yes. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming uh, to the seminar today. It's really a pleasure to host Dr. Ian Crossfield, who comes to visit us from University of Kansas. Um, I met Ian when we were both postdocs at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy uh, in Heidelberg, Germany. Ian came to Max Planck from UCLA, where he got a PhD. Uh, and after MPIA, uh, he held a postdoctoral position, I believe he was a Hubble Fellow at University of Arizona for a while, and then you went to Santa Cruz. And then from Santa Cruz, you had a faculty position at MIT. And then from MIT, you went to Kansas. And so Ian's been, been bounced around a while, but uh, been doing excellent work the entire way, uh, doing pioneering work on transiting planets um, and uh, phase curves and secondary eclipses, uh, and now getting into um, stellar abundances in order to better understand uh, planet host stars. And so just a very wide uh, variety of experience uh, looking at transiting planets and other sort of adjacent kinds of objects. And so um, look forward to Ian's talk and please ask a bunch of questions on whatever uh, you want to ask. Yeah, at the top it says admit. Okay, okay great. Thanks for that introduction, Josh. Um, the moral of the story of my background that Josh just gave is Nobody should have to bounce around in their career as much as I did. I should have just taken that MPP with Avi a decade ago and then never left the. Or the civil servant. Yeah, so, so uh, all you junior scientists, um, just stay put if you can. It's not always easy. So I think we've got this show up and running. It's clear that there's a couple of, a bit of formatting errors on my title here um, because we had to convert the talk from LibreOffice to PDF and move it from my computer to uh, another computer. But we'll do as best we can. I'm sort of going to talk to you about two different projects that uh, I and my group have been working on. So the first, they're, they're not really related, but it's been so long. It's been two and a half years since I gave a visiting talk. So I wanted to cram two talks into one. Um, but so the first half, I'll try to focus on this work that we've got in review, a, a rocky, small, small exoplanet, a measurement of its atmosphere, its properties, or lack thereof. And then also uh, I'll finish up in the second half talking about something completely different, which is uh, chemical abundance properties of exoplanet host stars, specifically ones that are being targeted by James Webb very soon. So uh, feel free to interrupt with questions and here we go. So starting off with the, uh, there we go. So talking about rocky planets, right? The decadal survey recently prioritized the ultimate search for biosignatures and things of that nature around planets like the Earth, around sun-like stars. We're not there yet. It's gonna take a lot of effort to get there, but there's still a, a large and growing amount of interest in studying the parameters of these rocky planets. And so this is just a, anyway, this is the classic mass radius diagram of exoplanets. Can I move this? That's a little better. Okay, so this is the, the planet I'm going to talk about in a little bit is DJ 1252b, which is a little bit bigger, a little bit larger and heavier than the Earth and Venus. Uh, we know a large number these days, a large number of these small, rocky terrestrial planets. What we really don't know for most of them is how conditions on them actually compare. That's one of these long-term goals. Right, so one of the key ways that we measure these properties uh, especially these short period planets is from eclipses, transits, and phase curves. So when we're using LUVEX to study these habitable zones, we'll use direct imaging, but again, we're not there yet for these rocky planets. So I'll be talking mainly about eclipses, secondary eclipses, which are complementary to transits. The transit tells you uh, stuff, something about how light is filtered through the planet's atmosphere. The eclipse tells you about the intrinsic thermal emission from the planet but you get it in a differential measurement when it's blocked by the star. So these rocky planets, of course, are gonna be studied in great detail by James Webb, which is working wonderfully from all that I hear. These are just some simulated models from Carolyn Morley a few years back, just showing, for example, for some of the Trappist planets, how with just a couple transit observations, James Webb is gonna be really able to finally distinguish between different atmospheric compositions of these rocky planets, even for, for atmospheres that are uh, very different from the hydrogen dominated gas giant atmospheres that we've mostly been studying today. So, so that'll be studies in transmission. We really won't be able to measure much about the thermal emission of planets like this. And so what I'll be talking about today is more these measurements of 
intrinsic thermal energy. All right, so to date, there have really only been two tight atmospheric constraints on small rocky exoplanets. And so when I say small, I mean smaller than roughly one and a half, 1 1.6 times the size of the Earth. This is right beneath we call the radius valley or the radius gap. We think most planets smaller than this are probably dominated by rock and iron like the Earth and like Venus are. And so these atmospheric constraints really only, both of them come from thermal emission measurements taken during eclipses and phase curves. There've been a lot of attempts to measure transit spectroscopy of these sort of planets. I think it's fair to say that although those have been able to rule out some atmospheric compositions, there's, they still leave most of the parameter space unexplored, maybe the most plausible atmospheric space. So one of these, the, I would say the first strong constraint we had of this type was a couple of years ago with this uh, Spitzer four and a half micron phase curve of the planet LHS 3844. This was one of the early small planets found in the test mission, uh, in one of the first sectors actually. And although we still don't actually have a mass for this planet, it's just something like 1.4 or so times the size of the Earth. So this is probably a, a rocky planet. It's a bit bigger than the Earth. And what you see here on this uh, plot here from the paper is a measurement of the planet's phase curve. Just think of over here, you're seeing it, the planet at the new moon, and so you're not seeing much illumination. And here you're seeing full moon where the planet is very strongly illuminated. Except it's not the reflected light like we see from our moon. We're seeing the thermal emission from the planet because it's so hot. It's in an orbital period that's something like a day, a little less than a day. This dip here right in the center, that's the secondary eclipse. That's where the planet's thermal emission is blocked by going behind the star briefly. Then it passes out again. And so from the depth of this eclipse and from the fact this phase curve uh, as fit by this sin more or less sinusoidal model is very symmetric. There's no offset in the peak of that sinusoid from the eclipse. Uh, it was clear that this planet didn't have a sizable atmosphere. We have to be careful what we mean. Uh, sizable in this case, based on the observational constraints alone, only meant a surface pressure of something like less than 10 times the Earth's atmospheric surface pressure. So if you had an, an Earth-like atmosphere on this planet, we probably wouldn't have been able to detect it with Spitzer. Uh, but because this planet is so in such a short period orbit, it's being really intensely irradiated by its host star, it probably couldn't hold on to an Earth-like atmosphere anyway. So by those two complementary lines of reasoning, um, the conclusion was that this thing didn't really have an atmosphere. So this is the first measurement like this. Another one came uh, from Laura Kreidberg's graduate student just this past, this year actually. And so this is the planet K2-141, actually obviously discovered by K2. And uh, this is also a rocky planet, a little bit larger. I think this is something like one and a half times the size of the Earth. So getting closer to that radius gap, but still below it. And here, because K2 looked at its star stars for longer than TESS does, and because K2 had a larger aperture, they were actually able to detect both the Spitzer eclipse and phase curve and the K2 eclipse and phase curve. So we had measurements in, so now it's a two point spectrum instead of the one point spectrum. And uh, the combination of these also showed that this planet probably didn't have much in the way of atmosphere. Its phase curve looked very similar to this phase curve for LHS J4. So what this talk, the first half of this talk is going to be about is going to be providing a, a third data point here. It's really sort of revealing the trend that these small planets don't really have much in the way of atmospheres. So this is, as I said, rocky exoplanet GJ1252b. So it shows up here on this diagram right here. So here it is. I talked about that mass and radius. It's in an orbital period of about 12 hours. Right? Mercury's orbital period is 88 days, but this thing is half a day. So this is really close to its M-type host star, which is about 0.4 solar radii, 0.4 solar mass. And uh, we know from the rotation period of this star that it's roughly the same age as the Earth. So this is a planet that's comparable in the age to the Earth, fairly comparable in mass and radius as well, but it's way more intensely irradiated, both in terms of the total amount of energy received and the, the type of spectrum that's incident on the planet is qualitatively different. So it's a much cooler star. 
This was also discovered by Tess as TOI 1078. That was also still in the first year of the mission. So as soon as this uh, TOI was alerted by Tess, we had a, I was PI of a Spitzer program that was uh, designed to do quick follow-up of some of the best targets for atmospheric characterization using Spitzer. At the time, now uh, TESS is entering its fifth year of operations, I guess. There was no guarantee at the time that TESS was going to keep going. It might've been, we only got a 30 day window of observations and then we didn't observe these transits again. So part of the Spitzer program was to just observe a follow-up transit so the ephemeris doesn't decay too much. Uh, but another part of it for a smaller number of targets was measuring secondary eclipses, really trying to do a little bit of exoplanet characterization as well as just transit measure. So not to waste a lot of time talking about data reduction, but we did manage to detect this planet's secondary eclipse. So this is a stack of 10 Spitzer eclipses in the four and a half micron channel. And the last of these observations was taken within the last 10 days of Spitzer's operation before we just turned off the lights and it's slowly drifting away on a heliocentric orbit. So it, it should be back in a couple of decades. I hope we can fire it up again. So it, it doesn't look like much. And in terms of the depth measurement that the numbers are given up here, this is really about a five sigma measurement of the eclipse depth. But the fact that this depth is, the, the depth is consistent with what we more or less expect from this planet. And the fact that the timing of this dip occurs right at orbital phase 0.5, exactly half an orbit after the primary transit, makes us very confident that what we're seeing here really is the secondary eclipse of this rocky planet. And we could only have done this with, with Spitzer. The eclipse depth in the Hubble wave uh, band pass would be much, much lower than Hubble would have been able to observe. And James Webb wasn't around yet. This was our only way to do it. So the rest of this first part of my talk is going to be how much, you know, in the, in the spirit of how much blood can you squeeze from a stone? How much science can you get out of a single five sigma measurement in one band pass? And the answer is actually, a, we think at least a fairly interesting amount of science. So we measured the eclipse depth. What does that mean? The first thing is, first thing you do, you convert that to a brightness temperature. So assuming that this planet emitted like a black body, which is a stupid assumption for planets because planets are very complicated objects. Nonetheless, it's the first thing you try. It's a brightness temperature of about 1400 Kelvin, plus or minus 100 Kelvin. You can see our, our spectrum, our one point spectrum of this planet shown here. This is just a black body model. Why doesn't it look like any black body you've ever seen? Because we transiting people always plot this in terms of the ratio of this planetary flux to the stellar flux. This is a ratio of fluxes. It's an M dwarf, so the M dwarf isn't like a black body either. And so all these features you see in this model are just stellar features in printed. That's the secret sauce aspect of this plot. So about 1400 Kelvin brightness temperature. So you can, uh, you know, hot Jupiter people have been making these sort of measurements for uh, almost 20 years now. And so the classical thing you do is you can estimate the temperature of the day side of your planet, the equilibrium temperature and energy balance based on the temperature of your star, the stellar radius, your semi-major axis, and some fudge factors that account for how much of that energy is going to be reprocessed and sent back out. F is, the, uh, F is the level of heat redistribution around the planet, except it's, it's big if the day side is very hot and it's small if the day side is very cool. A is the albedo, the reflectivity of the planet. And so if you, if you plug in the parameters that would give you the hottest possible temperature, and so an albedo of zero means, meaning you absorb all the incident starlight and F equals two thirds, like I said, it's parameterized weirdly, um, that would basically be bare rock, that's the maximum temperature you could get. And actually you calculate a brightness temperature of about 1400 Kelvin. So actually this immediately tells us that this planet's day side is about as hot as it can possibly be. I mean, short of some mechanism that intentionally beams extra energy out of the planet at four and a half microns. So this is just the fancy Bayesian posterior version of what I just told you. You can plot the bond albedo of the planet on this vertical axis, the redistribution efficiency here, and the darker shaded regions are just more likely. And so we can set interesting two sigma limits on the level of heat redistribution from day to night around this planet. It's fairly inefficient at redistributing that heat. And on the albedo, it's, it's got a 
moderately low bond albedo. I mean, that's less, it's less than Venus, but it's, it's not as tight a two sigma limit as you might like, but uh, it's a small planet and a small telescope. This is suggestive of little to no atmosphere on the planet. A uh, little, a small amount of atmosphere does not redistribute heat very effectively, so that moves F to the right, and uh, the albedo isn't necessarily indicative. But but the combination of these and this high temperature suggests a, a small atmosphere, little or no atmosphere already. So the next step was to actually compare this to some atmospheric models. We want to compare this single eclipse step in one band to a whole suite of model atmospheres because maybe this planet does have an atmosphere. So the main modeling work there in our effort was done by uh, Mate Malik, who's a postdoc just, just up the road a little bit at the University of Maryland. Uh, and he was using his Helios code to calculate a big suite of different types of atmospheric models. So models with a variety of different uh, absorbers, all these different absorbing molecules, different concentrations from pure, you know, pure CO2 down to just one part per million CO2 with the option of various sort of spectrally more or less inactive gases. We don't claim that this is, that these are all plausible atmospheres. And we certainly don't claim that this is an exhaustive search of all possible atmospheres. We're just trying to do decent due diligence and search a reasonably wide range of parameter space. We also searched across a, a, a wide array of uh, surface pressures. So basically no atmosphere, very thin surface pressure or very dense. Venus's surface pressure is 92, 93 bar. So this is a little bit denser than the Venus. So this model here shows a pure CO2 atmosphere. You can think about this with a surface pressure of 100 bars. You can think about this as kind of a very crude analog of a Venusian atmosphere. And it doesn't match our measurement at all, OK? So even though it's a single band, you can rule out lots of interesting types of atmospheres. CO2 absorbs really strongly, especially at 4 to 5 microns. That's why there's almost no flux coming out of this model. So you know, we, we just try more models. So for example, a pure CO2 atmosphere with a one bar surface pressure, still CO2 absorbs so much, even actually if it was pure CO2, but only 0.01 bars, CO2 is such an effective absorber at these wavelengths that um, it still is not consistent with our measurement. The black square is the band average measurement. So that's one type of atmosphere this planet couldn't have. We tried, we compared to a whole suite of them. I'm not going to show you all of those different models, but we did the same sort of examination here. So the result is that like LHS 3844, we, all of our models indicate that this surface pressure has to be something less than roughly 10 bars. So this contour plot here is now uh, showing for, a, for various types of surface pressure and different concentrations of, in this case, carbon monoxide, What's the eclipse depth in our band pass predicted by that model? And so all these dark regions are consistent with our eclipse depth at one sigma or better. All of these light shade regions are strongly inconsistent. And so this is just CO, but for all of these different types of models, we, time and again, we got this consistent result that the atmosphere can't be thicker than about 10 bars of pressure. This planet definitely, uh, you know, it's much highly, more highly irradiated than Venus, but this thing is not a super Venus. It's, it doesn't have an atmosphere like that. It has a much thinner atmosphere. And when we, we then, uh, so Michelle Hill, who's a graduate student with Stephen Kane at UC Riverside, did some atmospheric uh, modeling and mass loss calculations. And so if you do some uh, sort of back of the envelope, say energy limited mass loss calculations, you get that based on its irradiation, if this is a more or less typical medium aged M dwarf, this planet should be, would be losing something like 101% of an Earth mass per billion years of atmosphere. It may not sound like much, but that's actually a lot of atmosphere. And uh, what this plot here is showing is a, a combined model of mass loss with outgassing from the material in the mantle. Molten material inside the planet can hold a lot of dissolved gases that are slowly released over time. That's one of the ways that these sort of rocky planets build up their secondary atmospheres. And uh, so these different curves, these are for concentrations of uh, carbon and other volatile species that are 700 times what's in the Earth's mantle, 100 times what's in the Earth's mantle, 10 times. And you can see in each of these models that for a while, for the, say the first few million years, these models are outgassing 
so effectively that they're able to build up a, a very sizable atmosphere, maybe even thousands of bars. It's a toy model, but, but still that's the result. But that eventually they all run out of gas. Literally, they run out of dissolved gases in the mantle and this mass loss rate has just stripped it all away and there's nothing really left. And uh, there's not a curve here for an Earth-like mantle because the, uh, like this point here shows, the outgassing is so limited compared to this mass loss rate, that you'd never actually build up an atmosphere at all. And if you further fold in the fact, which we didn't, that actually when an M dwarf is young, it's putting out a lot more high energy radiation. And so your atmosphere would be even more effectively stripped in these early days. It seems very clear, unless you have this almost ridiculously large volatile concentration in a magma, which if we had any geologists in the room, they would, they would be laughing right now. Um, that we consider a model like this. So we don't think that any, any reasonable atmosphere of this type could survive to the present day. If there isn't a thick atmosphere. We don't think an atmosphere could survive. So we feel reasonably confident in being able to say that like K2141 and LHS 3844 before it, this thing probably doesn't have an atmosphere at all. Uh, Mate also ran us some bare rock models. So these are some model emission spectra for different types of mineral composition. Again, this is in the spirit of sort of toy models. If you imagine the planet that's made of nothing but basalt or the planet that's made of nothing but granite. Okay, we don't take these as necessarily seriously, but it's at least a first step toward perhaps the ability to understand the mineralogical makeup of these exoplanets. And uh, this isn't very conclusive. These bottom two models, as I note here on the slide, are inconsistent at two sigma, but all these other points are consistent at two sigma or better. So with a little bit better precision, or maybe with some spectral resolution, hint, hint, James Webb, uh, you could hope to really make some, some useful discriminating statements about, about what uh, the minerals of this planet might be made of. But, so I wouldn't read too much into this, but it's interesting to think about the fact that we're at the cusp, even with Spitzer, apparently we were at the cusp of being able to discriminate between different types of mineral makeup, just from the emissions spectrum. And there's no, there are already several approved James Webb programs for other planets to make these sort of measurements. Using the All right, so now that we have a sample of three rocky planets with these sort of measurements, you know, an astronomer really only needs two data points to start looking for trends. So three is more than we need. And I'm actually gonna show four planets here because I'm gonna throw in a, a planet just a, it's a little bit bigger than the radius gap, 55 Cancri E. This is you know, an oldie, but a goodie. People have been studying this planet for a couple decades. If I don't think it's a rocky planet, there's disagree there is some disagreement in the community. But anyway, it's, it's close enough to this issue. So this plot is, show, is gonna show planet radius on the x-axis versus a normalized measure of brightness temperature. This is normalized because none of these planets are irradiated in quite the same way. So this is how bright does it look at four and a half microns compared to how bright could it look if it had its maximum uh, possible brightness temperature, like I talked about before. And so you could get as hot as 1.0, bare rock, zero albedo, no atmosphere, you could go all the way down to zero, potentially. This uh, dotted line here is only significant because that's what you get if you have, if you still had zero albedo, but you have uniform redistribution of heat from day to night. So the planet is the same temperature everywhere. Or you just have a really high albedo. So you can trade off those parameters. So here are the four planets that have been, that have this sort of measurement made today. And it could be coincidence, it could be not, the fact that they seem to fall kind of into two distinct groups. There's these two smaller planets, LHS3844 and our target, GJ1252b. I haven't mentioned it yet, but this is the smallest exoplanet for which a thermal emission measurement has been made in the infrared. That record isn't gonna stand for long with James Webb coming along now, um, but that was a neat thing to be able to say as well. And these two larger planets, K2141 is a little bit below that radius gap. 55 Cancri E is a little bit bigger than it. They're, they both have slightly cooler or slightly lower brightness temperatures at four and a half microns. So the interpretation of 55 Cancri from its phase curve is that the phase curve is asymmetric. And so that's why I think it probably has an atmosphere. I don't know, uh, question. 
there are, so the, that's a good question. These are all very short period. These are what we would call ultra, ultra short period planets, USPs. Uh, their orbital periods are all, I think they're all roughly a day or less. So they're all extremely highly irradiated. They're, that's the only type of planet with Spitzer that we could make, that we could hope to detect the thermal emission. Good question. I think I do. I think I am going to show a plot that talks a little bit about vaporization temperatures. Um, so, uh, but I can tell you roughly that also these two planets here on these two bigger planets are also the um, actually the next plot. Yeah, the two smallest planets. Let's do this one first. The two smallest planets are as hot as they can possibly be. The two bigger planets are not. Is this a radius effect? Maybe. But if I make the same plot versus how intensely are they irradiated is exactly what you're asking. The two smallest ones are also the ones that are the least irradiated. So this is, this has an equilibrium temperature of something like a thousand Kelvin on the day side. Our planet's a little hotter than that one. These two are much hotter, right? When you're talking about temperatures of 2,500 Kelvin or more, you can definitely vaporize rock there. So the two coolest planets are the two smallest, are the ones that are as hot as they can be. The two bigger ones are the two hotter ones, and they're not quite as bright as they could be in this band pass. So, so I was saying, I think, I think at least the interpretation of 55 Cancri E is that it has an atmosphere based on the asymmetry of its phase curve, um, and just based on looking at its mass and radius, probably. Uh, K2141 is the only one of these three where we have a two band measurement. Remember, we had the K2 optical measurement and the Spitzer 4.5 micron measurement. So, their conclusion from that analysis was actually that it had a, a slightly non zero albedo, which helps to cool off your day side a little bit too. So, uh, it's entirely possible that with such a small sample size, we're just seeing hints of trends just because that's what you do with a tiny sample. We saw that many times with hot Jupiters. Avi is laughing here. Because we know we know that was true, um, but every once in a while it pans out. So it's going to be really interesting to see with James Webb's capabilities far in excess of Spitzer uh, whether either these trends really pan out or if they don't. So um, let's see. Speaking of mineral atmospheres, so this uh, our planet it might be able to have what's the, what people call a, an exosphere or a mineral atmosphere. Uh, but it would be very tenuous. So this is a plot from uh, Megan Mansfield's paper a few years ago showing, this is just a plot that shows based on the temperature at the substellar point, when it's high noon on the equator, how much material of your rocky planet are you just vaporizing off into, uh, and then losing the space essentially. And so if you're, uh, the answer is not very much, that our planet is kind of on the upper edge of the types of planets she was looking at. And it's something like 10, maybe 10 to 100 meters of surface material per giga year, if you assume this is a really effective process. So, I mean, 100 meters across the entire surface of an Earth-sized planet is a lot of material, but, not, but it's not a lot of material compared to the total mass of the planet. You could feel, you could feel either way you wanted to about that. So this makes it look like it's losing a lot of material. But uh, there have also been a, a number of groups simulating what kind of atmosphere does that form when all of this stuff is vaporized up. This is a paper uh, from Jamila Miguel a couple of years back now. And this just shows for different levels of planetary temperature, assuming a roughly Earth-like composition, what are all of the different vaporized species that would be present in the atmosphere and what would be the, the partial pressure in the atmosphere? So if you're talking about a, a rocky thing at 3000 Kelvin, you can really vaporize a lot of rock. And so then you're, you're actually forming a evaporated mineral atmosphere of a tenth of a bar, or maybe even comparable to the surface pressure of the Earth. Um, but that's not what we're talking about for a planet. GJ 1252B is a funny world because it's, sorry, this thing keeps just uh, advancing. It's just hot enough 
that it definitely has some melted material and some evaporated material, but it's, uh, it's cool enough that this mineral atmosphere would be very tenuous. And so at least in these models, it'd be a, a partial pressures of less than a microbar. So that's essentially totally optically thin at almost all wavelengths. You really wouldn't be able to observe this. So whereas for these, for these hotter planets, right, 2,500 Kelvin or more, they have a, you'd expect them to have a very optically thick mineral atmosphere. So if you want to study the volatile component of a rocky planet, you might look at the emission spectrum of these two. If you want to study the surface composition and mineralogy, you might try to do that uh, using these two cooler planets or others like it. There's a small but growing sample of uh, mostly test discoveries that are uh, comparable, comparable in quality and signal, expected signal noise to these. But these are really among the, the best few targets. So in conclusion, for the, in, for the first half of my talk here, this is the smallest exoplanet with a thermal infrared uh, measurement to date. We have a sample of four planets, if you're generous, three planets, because I don't think 55 Cancri E is really rocky. And, uh, but it definitely suggests that these planets all have pretty low albedos, very inefficient heat redistribution, and they probably have not much in the way of an atmosphere. And these bigger, hotter things seem to either have more atmospheres or maybe there are other weird things going on. But uh, I think it's probably, we're probably seeing an atmosphere versus size effect. But we need, we need more observations. Yeah, question. So, uh, I was asking my question, uh, That's a good question. So the question was, oh, can you, oh, yeah. yep, I'm, I'm on it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. The, the comment was five sigma is more than enough. And the question was, do we look for variability since we had 10 epochs of observations? And we did look at that, but the trouble is if you divide five by square root of 10, then you're talking about, you know, less than two sigma per measurement. And so they're not all consistent. You know, statistics tell you that some points should scatter away from the mean. So there wasn't really anything conclusive that we could see. Yeah, it would be nice to be able to say something like that. I think for some of these uh, cycle one James Webb programs that are looking, for example, at the LHS 3844 and other worlds, they have multiple visits and they'll obviously have higher signal to noise per visit. So I think we'll have a chance at answering that question. Like, are there IO-like eruptions from time to time? Or, Uh, the question in brief was, these hotter planets almost certainly have magma oceans, which are going to do all sorts of weird things um, and are going to show up very differently from atmospheres in the spectra. So, and what have we thought about that? So GDA 1252b probably does have some melted material right around the substellar point. It's, it's kind of borderline for ours. So, so we, we did, I did show these, models of sort of different rock compositions. It's unclear to me how representative those are for a planet at this temperature. For those two hotter worlds I showed, assuming they're both rocky, K2141 almost certainly is, um, they would definitely have big melted pools on their substellar point, which is obviously going to result, as you say, in a very different, qualitatively different spectrum. Uh, not both of the magma ocean and because of this vaporized rock atmosphere. Um, I can't tell you right now in what way is that is different, but I know that those models are out there in the literature. So, and it's something people are definitely thinking about. Oh, sure. Let's uh, check the chat here. Oh, um, you're just seeing my chin. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, 
folks online can't hear people in the room. Yes, okay. The planet falls on the cosmic shoreline. Yes, uh, so that's a good, I like that question because we actually address that in the uh, paper that's in review. So it's well, it's well on the wrong side of the cosmic shoreline uh, in terms of the wrong side being where you couldn't sustain an atmosphere based on this uh, Zonley paper from a few years ago. So from that, you might also conclude, of course, it doesn't have an atmosphere. But actually, this planet I've talked about a couple of times, 55 Cancri E, does, it's also on the wrong side of this cosmic shoreline. Uh, but I think from the phase curve that it probably does have an atmosphere. So either the cosmic shoreline is not very well calibrated for things with the radiation temperatures over 2,500 Kelvin, which I think is possible, um, or I just don't have a good intuitive sense for whether a phase curve of a planet like that is clearly indicative of the presence of an atmosphere. Like I said, some people out there in the community would argue it's a planet without an atmosphere. So, um, so that, that, that's where it is. Our planet here anyway is on the wrong side of the shoulder. And uh, let's we'll take a question in the room. That's the assumption, yeah. yeah. So that they are tidally locked is the assumption. That's a good question. I'm that I'm not. Let me see. So if they have a big magma ocean, those can redistribute some heat. Sorry, the question is, um, how do you redistribute heat at all if you have no atmosphere? So a magma ocean, if it's deep enough and thick enough and large enough, can do that a bit, but it's fairly ineffective compared to having an atmosphere. So my understanding is that if you don't have an atmosphere, you're, you're probably just not redistributing heat especially effectively. Um, that's, that's right. Um, unless someone in the room wanted to correct me on that. Suggestion was you could also potentially redistribute heat with volcanism. It would be exci that's exciting to think about. Uh, let me take Peter's question here online, which was the night sides of this planet. So it should be the night sides of these planets should be very cool. If um, I'm not going to flip all the way back, but if you think back to that phase curve of LHS 3844, the flux from the night side of the planet was basically dropping off to consistent with zero, more or less. So but with very large error bars because it's tough to measure zero flux. So presumably these uh, planets should be able to maintain all these volatiles if they can make it to the night side. And unless there's all sorts of night side volcanoes going off everywhere and re-volatilizing, then I guess that these planets should um, be able to maintain volatiles on the night side if they're also tightly locked. That would be my guess. It's, we, we know Observationally, we know next to nothing about the night size of these planets, but. Uh, yeah. That, that's right, yeah. So Avi here in the room is suggesting, is saying rightly, I think, that this indicates the way to diagnose this is phase curve spectroscopy. And so that's most of the cycle one programs for these sort of planets. James Webb, so why would you, why do photometry, the, the transiting people say anyway. So, so I think most of the, all of those programs are spectroscopic and most of them are phase curves. So we should have those data to see what they were doing. Let's see, is there anything else here? Thanks. Yeah, please. Back to your slide of the next one, the The question is, we only go down to a thousand Kelvin on this plot. Is there any guidance from theory or models as to what happens at cooler temperatures? Basically, does this turn back over? Um, that's a good question. I mean, to the extent that as you get less and less irradiated, eventually you should be able to hold on to an atmosphere. And so at that point, once you can, like these models I was showing, 
many of them predict, as, as you know, most of these interesting molecules all absorb, especially at this four and a half micron point and at, at many other wavelengths. So once you can hold on to an atmosphere that's absorbing things, then you're going to start going down on this, on the vertical axis here, I think. Where I, I think you could, you'd have to do some, a little bit of fudging to sort of convert day side equilibrium temperature into estimated atmospheric mass loss rates. But you could probably do that roughly and, and predict roughly where you'd expect it to hold on to an atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first half of my talk. Well, I'm just going to, this second half isn't going to be a full half, so don't get scared if you're online. This should be pretty quick. So I just want to briefly talk about some work that uh, my grad student Alex Blansky is doing on a slightly related but mostly different topic. And this is on measuring precise stellar abundances of exoplanet host stars, specifically for James Webb. This is Alex here. He's a third year grad student, so look for him on your NPP market in a couple of years. So uh, the long and the short of it is, right, Anyone who studies planets knows that there is a link between stellar and planetary abundances. This is one of these classic plots from solar for solar system abundances, showing the planetary to solar abundance ratios of different elements. All these different measurements here for Jupiter are roughly three times more enhanced in these heavy elements than the sun is. The smaller number of measurements for Saturn, which is a little bit smaller than Jupiter, suggests that it's something like 10 times more enhanced. And there's it's really this one measurement for Uranus and Neptune, but that's something like 100 times, more or less, so, which is smaller planets yet. Uh, and for Jupiter, where we've measured many abundances, this is all roughly consistent within a factor of a few. So it suggests that there is some reasonable, that there may be some reasonable correspondence between stellar and planetary abundances. The issue that Alex's work is trying to address is that we've measured many uh, exoplanet atmospheric abundances, but these measurements are almost always reported relative to solar abundances. Okay, you'll see we measured the, the planet, the, the atmospheric composition of WASP, whatever, and the, uh, it, it's 100 times solar metallicity. That's all fine, but if the star it's orbiting is a high metallicity star, maybe it's less surprising to find a high metallicity atmosphere or, or vice versa. So what we want to do, and so things like the iron abundance, the Fe over H, this is, that's almost always reported, but any other element, which is usually the elements that we're not measuring, you know, the elements that we are measuring in the exoplanets are usually not iron. We'd like to know what are their chemical abundances in the star so we can really make a same apples to apples comparison like this plot is for the solar system. I just said that. So um, just, to, just in a nutshell, we're using a tool called uh, Kexpec, which is built on a framework called the Canon. This is a machine learning technique that takes in a training set of spectra of various types, takes in a training set and a set of labels, abundance labels that have been measured by some other technique. And it generates a tool where instead of having, hiring your graduate student to, take, to calculate abundances of one spectrum per day, uh, it just takes a couple seconds and you can do thousands of stellar abundances in a reasonable PhD time. So what Alex has been doing is applying this Keck spec framework to all public Keck high res spectra of roughly sun-like stars, the FGK stars. There's about a 5,000 star sample. And what we're doing is building up a, a measurement of 15 different chemical abundances, not just Fe over H, but all carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, plenty of weird elements too that we probably never will find in exoplanets. Uh, this is mainly working for FGK stars. A current sample, we're, we're getting some more data as well, it includes 20 different James Webb Cycle 1 exoplanet targets. These are both transiting and directly imaged planets. They're GR, um, GTO, GO, and ERS program, where we expect to measure interesting chemical abundances in the planetary atmospheres as well. And uh, you know, even if you think James Webb isn't very interesting, all of these nearest, brightest FGK stars, these will probably be the targets a few decades from now for LUVEX, right? And we're really going to want to understand the chemical abundance of those systems very well as well, because 
habitability is an interdisciplinary effort and we're gonna wanna know everything we can about the chemistry. So uh, if someone in the audience, by the way, can tell me, there must be published target lists of, you know, from the HabEx and Lubar studies, but I couldn't find them in your reports. So if someone wanted to send me a list, I'd be good. Or tell me where to find them. Great, yeah. <laughs> They're probably, most of them are in our list. So I would love to know what they were. So this is just sort of showing that if you compare to the gold standard, things like John Brewer's hand, hand uh, spectrum by spectrum bespoke analyses, Alex's analysis gets very good agreement in all sorts of different elements. This is just four of them. To uh, the precision, because it's machine learning, isn't even if you make John Brewer into a machine, it's not quite as good as the real John Brewer, but you can still do pretty well. You're doing better than 0.05 dex, uh, and sometimes substantially better than that. It's just about all of these. So just a couple comments on applications. If you've done exoplanet atmospheres in the last couple of years, you heard a lot for me more than I wanted to hear about carbon-rich exoplanets. This, uh, I think, probably mirage that out there are these planets so enriched in carbon, they have more carbon atoms than oxygen. It's about a two to, it's, the ratio for the sun is about 0.5. Maybe these things are out there, but I think there have been a lot more claims than there should have been in reality. But if those were real, you could, uh, you'd have all sorts of very different chemistry. You'd have basically no H2O abundance suddenly in your atmosphere, but all these weird hydrocarbons the abundance shoots up because you've got all this carbon and no oxygen to pair it with. So if we go out there and start measuring um, planetary atmospheres and finding, measuring the carbon to oxygen ratio, what we ought to be doing is not comparing it to the solar ratio. That's more or less irrelevant for some particular star that you picked at random. We should be comparing it to the stellar C to O ratio. So this plot here is plotting C to O ratio versus the nitrogen to oxygen ratio of all of the stars in our sample along with those James Webb targets. And the carbon, carbon rich zone is way over here on the right. Jonathan Fortney also showed this in a paper uh, almost a decade ago. There are very few of these really carbon rich stars. So unless you can really bump up the carbon in these planets without bumping up the oxygen, then we shouldn't actually expect these things to be carbon rich. The next time you read the press release about the diamond planet, it probably isn't yet, but maybe it will be next time. Uh, so you can see there's a broad diversity of these stellar abundances though, right? Here's the sun. Uh, and most of this sample actually has a lower C to O ratio than the sun, not higher. And it, it's sort of with a range of a factor of two or so. So I've, uh, those of us who do this have read many papers predicting that James Webb will measure exoplanet atmospheric abundances to better than a factor of two. And so then you'd better know your stellar abundances to a factor of two. You can't just assume everything is the sun. And the case is even more extreme, I'd say, for the nitrogen to oxygen ratio shown here. Um, this is varying by something like a factor of three or four in this vertical axis. And again, um, I think I just said that right here, the N to O varies over an even wider range. And that's interesting because in the last couple of years, there have been a small but growing number of claims of um, detections of nitrogen bearing species in planetary atmospheres. Uh, I think I forgot to attribute this. I think this is, um, dang, I'm forgetting his name. Came out of the, the UK Cambridge group. Ryan McDonald, thank you, Avi. Yes, that's right. This is uh, from a paper by Ryan McDonald. There have been a couple other detections. Some of them I believe more than others, but I, I, I think Ryan's detections here are some, among the more plausible. And so the claim is that with our admittedly sometimes noisy HST transmission spectra, it seems like there's evidence of things like ammonia or uh, maybe even HCN. And there've been claims in these planets that I'm showing here and in a couple other planets as well. And whether or not you believe these claims, I think it's very clear that James Webb is going to succeed at detecting not just water, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide, but a much more diverse range of chemical species, probably including some nitrogen bearing species. So if I plot WASP 31 up here, actually that has a lower N to O ratio than the sun. And 209458 is even lower still, it's this hexagon right here. So we're detecting nitrogen even when the N to O ratio is lower than solar. So you know, maybe we can expect even more nitrogen bearing species in these other planets that have even higher uh, N abundances. We don't know. And this is just, this is just N, O, and, and C. There's just three elements, and there's going to be a lot more interesting ones that we're, uh, we're able to measure with that. 
and with other facilities like Ariel that are, are a little further down the road, not to mention Pandora, of course. So um, I'll just skip that in the interest of time. So just to, just to conclude then, I told you that second half was really not a full half, but um, I think this is interesting because we're on the cusp of the James Webb era of precise atmospheric abundances. And so the time is really, the time is ripe to take a closer look at the stellar abundances as well, because we're really going to need to carefully compare um, the planetary measurements to the stellar measurements. And so Alex's catalog, we're still finishing up the paper, but it should be a long, probably not before Webb's first science observations, but I think we can get it out before the first exoplanet uh, atmosphere papers are getting out. We have a running start anyway. So we've got about 5,000 stars. In addition to these 20-ish James Webb targets, there are almost certainly a number of James Webb cycle two targets in here. It's just we all don't know it yet. And not to mention lots of the Ariel tier three targets, just thousands of exoplanet host stars in general, because most of the Kepler sample is in there, observed by the CPS team. And uh, like I said, the LUVEX targets, most of them are in here as well. And we really need these precise solar abundances. So with that, I'll just put up conclusions from both half of this. And thanks everyone for their attention. I'm happy to take more questions. Sure. All right. We're going to the chat first. Ask Chris Stark. Yes, I did. His reply, his reply, though polite, was terse. He says, he said, I'm very busy doing James Webb commissioning. Ask me later. So <laughs> I haven't bothered Chris Stark again since. But yes, I uh, I will do that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I figured let priorities be priorities. Great. But yeah, I appreciate the show. Uh, are there questions online or in the room? So in the 5,000 start, how are you guys going to Um, so, so I mean, it'll all the measurements will all be released with the paper in uh, machine readable formats and free for dissemination on whatever services people want to have. I mean, it'll you know it'll be on Vizier and the CBS services, and if there are others that people think it should be on. Well, no. I mean, I. Yeah, we should talk about that when we, sorry, the question was, sorry for not repeating that. Uh, Avi says that we should have, we should aim higher than just putting it all in a catalog with paper. So I think that's a fair point. So I'd be happy to talk, talk more with you about best ways to do that. Nothing online, so let's. Uh, the question was, have we, I think, have we considered comparing this with other catalogs like the big online Hypatia catalog and others? Um, we have compared it to some other catalogs, not Hypatia in particular. I, I've used that a few times. My impression of Hypatia, correct me if I'm wrong, please, is that it, it, it's an attempt to draw in all abundance measurements from many different sources. So I haven't done a lot of work. We haven't done a lot of work, our team, before this measuring abundances like this, but in our conversations with people who have, they always tell us we should be really leery of anyone who's reporting abundances from different sources. So, so that's why we're not specifically comparing to that. Uh, the, the big catalog that we have done a lot of comparison to is the uh, Spox catalog that I alluded to, which is John Brewer and Deborah Fisher and Jeff Valenti and many other people over the years. So it's a good question. Um, we're hoping to extend this to the Southern hemisphere as well, um, using something like public HARPS data from ESO, all of their spectra are public. And um, there are many more spectra than there are public abundances. Uh, I will note that in your abundance analysis, M4 Great question. So the question was, M dwarfs are specifically absent in this uh, second half of my talk here. And what are we going to do about it? <laughs> so, so yes, many of the maybe 
some would say of the most exciting James Webb targets, for example, are around M dwarfs, around cooler stars. The issue is that it becomes much more complicated to measure precise chemical abundances as stars get cooler uh, because molecular features start to dominate. And so line blending is essentially occurring everywhere. There's no real continuum. And so people can do it and are doing it. And actually, I'm in the process of hiring a postdoc, Nada Hijazi, who's going to start in a couple of months, who I hope is going to help us in our group crack this problem as well. The, the other part of that answer is because our analysis here is relying on this machine learning tool so we can do bulk processing reasonably quickly. Uh, that tool is, it needs a training set. And all of the big multi-element training sets are on FGK stars for the reasons I just said. So we're limited to something like, when I say FGK, what I really mean is something like 4,600 Kelvin to 6,500 Kelvin. I think I showed that on the HR diagram. I had up there. So that's a big chunk of the sample, but there are a lot of stars below 4,600, 4,700 Kelvin that are interesting targets. So yeah, we, we want to do it and we hope to do it. Let's see, there's something in the chat. Johanna, thank you. That's great. I will check that out. I really appreciate it. And a question, uh, a connection between the two parts of my talk. A little bit. I, um, is there a utility investing in the relationship between compositions of USPs and the planet cores, these bare rock planets and their host stars? I think that that is, I think there is a connection a little bit here, but not much. If I had been able to say to you, we really think these rocky planets are based on, are built of this particular type of mineral, for example, then that, that would be a very strong connection and I would like to head in that direction. We're just not there yet with the precision that Spitzer gives us on the emission spectrum. Um, I, your point, your second point here about the metallicity of the host star, I have, that's not something I've explicitly looked at, but you're right, that would be a good thing to check out. The trouble is this sample of four planets that I talked about, the, I didn't really talk much about the stars, but these stars are pretty inhomogeneous. Um, LHS3844 and our planet are both M dwarfs, the M4 and, and a little bit later than M4, like M4 and M6. K2141 is a late K star. And 55 Cancri E is a G dwarf, I think. So I think that's right. So I think it's maybe even some people even call it a G sub dwarf sometimes, if I'm remembering right. So it, it's not a homo, it's an even less homogeneous stellar sample of these four planets than planetary. But yeah, as our sample grows, we should definitely look into that. And it's a good avenue for doing modeling. There's also, of course, lots of modeling of connecting stellar metallicity to uh, planetary bulk metallicity, like Daniel Thorngan and many other people have worked on that as well. But that's beyond the scope of this talk. Okay, yeah, so we're about to run out of power any moment. Uh, so I think, and we're at the half hour. So thanks everyone online very much. Thanks folks in the room, we really appreciate it.